Hi, I'm Luke Maxfield. I am a tutor with Med School Coach. I tutor for USMLE Step 2, 3, and Comlex 1, 2, and 3. We're going to go through a question stem today, break it down, look at how we can save you some time, identify distinguishing features, and then we'll tie it all together. So we have an 81-year-old farmer who presents to his primary care physician with a non-healing sore on his cheek. The patient has a past medical history of hypertension. It's controlled with hydrochlorothiazide. He states that he first noticed the spot as a scaly bump, but over the past six months, it's progressively gotten larger and occasionally bleeds. His temperature is 98 degrees Fahrenheit. His blood pressure is 130 over 94. The heart rate is 76 and regular. Respirations are 12 per minute. The physical exam is notable for a hyperkeratotic papule over the left superior lateral cheek with hemorrhagic crust, and the lesion is shown in the image provided. What is the most likely diagnosis? All right, a couple points when you're approaching a question stem. So first off, one of the most efficient things that people do, because time is a very important factor, especially on the USMLE, you go to the last line of the question stem. And this helps get your mind thinking as to where you need to approach the problem, whether it's diagnosis, treatment, etc. In this case, what is the most likely diagnosis? Now, some people, and I prefer this myself, is looking just briefly at the answer choices because it puts your mind into an organ system. And when you're going through some of these length, lengthy vignettes with a lot of comorbidities, a lot of medications, not, not all of them directly relate to the problem, it's nice to be able to put yourself and put your mind into a place where you're already looking at and isolating one organ system. So here, we're clearly gonna be identifying something in the skin. So the first point as we go through the question stem, an 81 year old farmer, so this gentleman is older, he has a non-healing sore on his cheek, and because he's a farmer, occupations are usually deliberately placed. This, in this case, his exposure is probably sun exposure. He has hypertension and is controlled with hydrochlorothiazide. And not all medications, again, in the stems are going to be relevant. And it's up to you to quickly distinguish which ones are. And in this case, he's on one medication. And although you can arrive at the correct answer without it, hydrochlorothiazide along with loop diuretics have a sulfamoiety, and they do mildly, modestly increase the risk for skin cancers because they can um, lower your threshold for UV damage from the sun. Over the past six months, the scaly spot has gotten larger. It occasionally bleeds. Vital signs in this case, and especially when you identify um, that this is going to be a skin cancer, vital signs are normal. It's just a quick gestalt and then you can move on. The physical exam findings, you have a hyperkeratotic papule over the left superior lateral cheek with a hemorrhagic crest. So a lot of times with these dermatology images, you can probably arrive at the correct diagnosis through either the clinical vignette and the words they use or the image. They don't always rely on you to 100% be able to glean the information just from the picture itself. So in this case, the hyperkeratotic path of the left lateral cheek with hemorrhagic crust, they talk to us and say that the lesion is going to be shown in an image provided. Now, a couple ways you can approach this. Personally, I like to look at the image first. So when I look at the image, I already can identify in my mind, do I know this or not? And sometimes, and a lot of times, you're going to know the answer just by looking at the image quickly. This applies to dermatology questions, it applies to ophthalmology questions, and oftentimes radiology questions. So if you don't know it right off, that's okay. Then we're going to run through the differential diagnosis that they provide. So basal cell carcinoma, what we know about that, it's sun exposed or from chronic sun exposure. And then the clinical findings are classically a pearly papule with prominent telangiectasias. So here we have the history of sun exposure. So that's possible, but the clinical features do not match. So that one is likely out. The next one is a squamous cell carcinoma. So this also has a history of sun exposure as its primary risk factor. And then the clinical features in this are scaly papules 
And in this case, both add up. And so this one is a real contender and probably the right answer. Moving down the list then is a melanoma. This classically can be sun exposed, but does not have to be. And then the other feature is that it's pigmented, not scaly. So this one, we ha do not have pigment. So that one's out. Seborrheic keratosis. This is a benign cutaneous neoplasm, but it often finds itself in this same list of differentials because it is a scaly and pigmented lesion and the pigment can look bizarre and it can meet the criteria for the A, B, C, D, E's of melanoma, asymmetry, border, color, diameter, and evolution. But these lesions are not strongly related to sun exposure. They are scaly and pigmented. So here we do not have all three of the clinical features lining up. And then Veruca vulgaris, or the common wart, this can also find itself in the same differential because it is scaly. But the other features in the stem, such as the patient's age, history of sun exposure, do not correlate well with a test trying to get out of you to answer a squamous cell carcinoma or verruca vulgaris. So usually with this, it'll be a child, and then they may even give you findings like thrombosed capillaries or little black dots that you see with the naked eye. So in this case, it's a squamous cell carcinoma. So this is a nice way that I put together to kind of keep these things distinct and separate in your mind. So the big four that are probably gonna show up at some point throughout the step one, two, or threes, because there's only so much dermatologic knowledge they expect a primary care provider, an internist, or other specialists to know. The squamous cell skin cancer, the basal cell skin cancer, which is the most common, malignant melanoma, and then the seborrheic keratosis, because it's a nice mimic for a melanoma. So in your mind, if you can organize them into these three areas, whether they're going to be pigmented, curly, or scaly. If you look at the table I made, you can actually see that there is no single lesion that overlaps with another single lesion in all three facets. Now, this does not hold true every time in the real world, but again, we're taking a test. And for the test, they need to have things be deliberate and discernible. So in this case, squamous cell skin cancers, like we talked about, they're not pigmented. And we're using absolutes because this is the test world. This is not the real world. This is not pearly, but it is scaly. This is its most prominent feature, a firmly adherent scale. They can ulcerate. They can be encrusted. They can do a lot of different things secondarily. But for the primary characteristics, this is what you're looking at. Basal cell skin cancers. Again, in the real world, it can have pigment. But right now at this test, no, basal cells are not pigmented. But they are pearly, and they are not scaly. And then the other side here, if you remembered or not, doesn't entirely matter, but they can have prominent telangiectasias or very prominent dilated blood vessels. Next one is the melanoma. This one is important because it's fairly common and it's a do not miss. You don't want to miss this on your patients regardless of the setting. So this is pigmented, but it is not pearly and it is not scaly. And then the last lesion is the seborrheic keratosis. This is pigmented and scaly. So if you break it down into these categories, the big four cutaneous tumors and neoplasms, they're all able to be distinguished from each other just based off of their clinical morphology. So in this case, let's run the list. So we have this lesion near hair bearing surface. Is it scaly? Yep. Is it pearly? Nope. Is it pigmented? Nope. So this naturally leads you to given the same options, squamous cell skin cancer. This case, we have, is it scaly? Nope. Is it pearly? Nope. And don't be confused here because a lot of times in these images, the flash of the camera is going to add some, letter, some layer of reflection on a lot of these images. And that's just something they can't compensate for. Even getting ideal photographs, you can't always get the perfect image 
and not have some background noise. So here, it is not pearly. This is just flash. And then is it pigmented? Absolutely. We have this reddish brown pigment over here, darker brown pigment here, pure black pigment here. And then these structures, even though it could be a flash, there also is a blue, white, blue, gray veil that could be associated with these with dermoscopy. But that's generally not seen with the naked eye. And therefore, this is most likely just flash. This being a malignant melanoma. So the next one, is it scaly? Yep. Is it pearly? Nope. This dry, crusty thing is not pearly. And is it pigmented? Yes. So we find ourselves with a seborrheic keratosis. This lesion, the same. Is it scaly? You could say there's a little scale here and here, but these are part of the secondary changes I talked about. So just take a step back. If you find yourself getting lost in the weeds in some of these images, just take a step back and say, what stands out to me? And in this case, it's very pearly. It's glistening. Similar thing with the flash, but the overall appearance, it just shines at you. So it's pearly. It's not scaly. Overall, it's not scaly. This is just scale from a crust or hemorrhage or ulcer erosion. And then it is not pigmented. Additionally, we have that fourth not listed feature of very prominent blood vessels. And these are almost always going to be present on the step exams because they're highly characteristic, at least of common neoplasms uh, for the basal cell skin cancer. And just taking a look side by side, so same thing, comparing and contrasting. So this gives you the big four. They commonly are gonna be in the same vignette as the answer choices, but really they're very easily distinguished from each other. And this is the kind of question where if you can knock down and lock this information down, have it readily accessible just by practicing something as simple as this two, three, four times, you're going to be able to answer this question in 10 to 15 seconds and use that time for another question stem that's longer and requires a lot more critical thinking. So squamous cell skin cancer, other testable features for this. There's very little additional information you need when answering these questions. But we talked about that it's a skin cancer from the sun. Occasionally they'll ask about the tumor suppressor gene P53. That's the most common mutation that can be found on step one, level one, um, and less frequently through step two and three where they're really one of your clinical knowledge. It presents, like we talked about, scaly on sun exposure. It's diagnosed here, shave biopsy. This can be seen on step two, where they really want you to be more involved in establishing the diagnosis and treatment. And then with that, treatment is local excision. Basal cell skin cancer, we talked about the same features, and that is sun exposure. But this one's actually the most common skin cancer. And the most common mutation is in the patched tumor suppressor gene. The presentation we talked about, sun exposed areas, pearly papules, prominent phalangiectasias. It's diagnosed similarly with a biopsy, shave biopsy. And then it's treated. This can be treated a couple different ways, but excision is reasonable for various subtypes or electrodesiccation and curatage, where you electrofulgrate it with electricity and then scrape it. Because there's a couple different options depending on the subtype, this treatment is less likely to be tested on the US assembly steps or complex exams because they don't expect you to know the difference between the subtypes of basal cells. That's more of a specialist thing. The malignant melanoma is a neoplasma melanocytes. The reason this is a do not miss disease, these can metastasize and they often affect younger individuals. The mutations, BRAF, depending on the source, says it's the most common, and so oftentimes in question banks, BRAF mutation being the most common mutation in melanomas, but specifically it's in non-chronically -chron sun-exposed skin. And then NRAS mutations is the most common on sun-exposed skin. And then it presents with the ABCDEs that I've talked about, asymmetry, border irregularities, 
color variation, diameter greater than or equal to six millimeters in evolution. And notably on African-Americans, it can occur on the palms and soles, so clearly not sun exposed areas. There are some important features here with the diagnosis. The preferred diagnostic modality is by an excisional biopsy, where let's say this is the melanoma. You actually, they actually want you to take out the whole thing, all the clinically visible pigment with one excision and send that into the pathologist. It does differ in real life. Most people don't do that just because we operate in a way that time is of the most importance. And so shave biopsy occurs in real life, but excisional biopsy is absolutely the right answer choice on the test. The most important predictor of metastasis is the depth, the Breslow depth. S100 is a stain that can be used for melanocytes. And then the treatment that they like to test on is wide local excision. And then the seborrheic keratosis, again, this is the benign mimic for mostly melanomas, both academically and the real world. So hopefully that gets you started with some quick and easy points for your STEP exams in the future.